is a land that is further than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare for us a dwelling place, sir. Let's commence our time of praise this evening. <laughs> Jesus. We're going to sing our next one is 773. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary.
were singing well this evening. Let's turn to 316. It was down at the feet of Jesus. Oh, the happy, happy day that my soul found peace in believing and my sins were washed away. 316 in the red book if you're just coming in. last one we're going to sing is number seven. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go on. Let's really sing this one out to the Lord in praise this evening.
that's all good singing tonight. We're going to commence now as we sing our opening hymn and we commence our service with 171. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace to sour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We stand to sing our opening hymn after the introduction, please. Thanks to Mark for leading us tonight and we're going to take a moment to pray together and just to ask for God's blessing and for his help upon our meeting, upon the word of God, upon the Walker sisters who have come to share in our meeting. Let's just pray for God's help and for his blessing. Our God and our Father, we come again tonight before your throne of grace in prayer. We come to you in the Saviour's name, and we thank you that in him and through him we have immediate access right in to the very presence of a thrice holy God. Father, we come in his name and we come depending only on the merits of his finished work on that cross at Calvary. We have sang tonight already, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me there. My burdened soul found liberty at the place called Calvary. Father, there is no other place like Calvary. And many of us tonight know the truth of those words because we have been there by faith. We have put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We realize that without him, 
we were without hope and that our sin would one day condemn us to a Christless eternity. We're so thankful, our Father, that you sent your Son to be the Savior of the world. We're so thankful for the place called Calvary and for the great debt that we owed and yet a debt we could never pay. The Lord Jesus Christ paid that debt in full, shed his own precious blood so that our sins might all be forgiven. Father, how could we ever find adequate words to express our gratitude to you for your Son, our Savior, for everything that he has done for us and for everything that he means to us tonight. And yet, our Father, right across this land of ours, we realize there will be many meetings just like this where the gospel will be proclaimed And we recognize, our Father, that this is still an essential exercise, perhaps far more essential than in years that have gone. Because, our Father, there are many who still do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. There are still many who have never heard about the cross work of the Lord Jesus. And, Father, it's our responsibility to do what we can not just from the pulpit, but individually as your people to go out into the world and bring the gospel to those who have never heard. Father, we used to talk about those across the world who had never heard, and yet we have those in our own province in all their lifetime have never darkened the door of a church. Oh God, our Father, we pray that you would burden our hearts for the souls of men and women and young people who are still strangers to grace and to God. Thank you for all who have been able to come. We thank you, Father, that we can enjoy fellowship together in these spiritual things. And we pray, Lord, for each one of us that you will draw near to us, minister to our hearts, help us to rejoice in knowing that we're saved, and help us, our Father, if we're not saved, to seek the Lord Jesus Christ while he is yet to be found. Thank you for those who will join us live on Facebook from various places. We ask that God would bless them and God would encourage them and those that are not saved, that God would save them soon. Father, we look to you tonight for the Walker sisters. We thank you for them. We thank you for their ministry. We pray that God will bless them as they share with us tonight. We thank you for their faith in Christ. We thank you for the way in which you have used their ministry. And tonight we pray that they will feel very much at home amongst us and that God will bless them richly and through them that you will bless each one of our hearts. Remember those who'd love to be here but cannot for various reasons. We think especially of those who have been in hospital recently, those who are in hospital tonight, those, our Father, who are not able to get out because of old age and infirmity. We thank you for each one of them, for their faithfulness in the past, and we pray that God would bless them in these latter days of their journey. So hear our prayers, our Father. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be here tonight and to sound forth the glorious gospel of God's grace. So bless what is said and bless what is sung and may both exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and bring great glory to your thrice holy name. All these things we ask in the Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen. Can I take this opportunity to welcome you all to our evening gospel service at Banbridge Baptist Church. We welcome those who are listening live and on Facebook and those visiting with us this evening. I'd like to welcome the Walker sisters as our singers this evening. It's lovely having you here at our gospel meeting. And may you know the help and the blessing of God as you minister in song for him this evening. Pastor Taylor will be looking at lessons from Dr. Luke. And the topic this evening is the parable of the Good Samaritan Youth Fellowship. will follow the evening service at 8 p.m. over in the hall, and there will also be a praise group practice after service in the church building. The announcements for the incoming week, Monday, 
a children's training night with David Crutchley from CEF, and that's at 7.30 p.m. This has been arranged for all workers with children within the church and for those who would like to be trained for future work. It's essential that all attend so we can be better equipped to teach children the Word of God. So if you're working with children, please plan to attend that meeting tomorrow evening. We did mention this morning that there was toddler group, but there, that has now been cancelled, so there's no toddler group on Tuesday, and then the Good News Club at 6.45. Then on Wednesday, this will take the form of a genderism, an RSE video, and that's in the main church building, not in the church hall, and that's at 8 p.m., and it will not be broadcasted over Facebook. So if you want to see that information, please come out uh, to the church building. Pastor Taylor was, I think he did share a wee bit about that this morning. Then on Friday, Bible study at 12, 15 p.m. And then on Friday evening, the youth club, and that's at 7.30 through to 9.30 p.m. And our youth fellowship are away at the Christmas market. Then on Saturday the 25th, it's our dinner and fun night, and that's at 5.30 p.m. Uh, and we had to make sure that all menus and all money was returned by today. So make sure that if you have it with you tonight, please get it to our brother, Colin. Next Lord's Day, 26th of November, Sunday school and Bible class at 10 a.m. And then at 10.45, our prayer meeting, 11.30, morning service and breaking of bread. Children's talk next week will be Letitia MacDonald and the Children's Church will be Phil Buchanan and Claire McKelvey. Uh, Julie Corbett, Rachel Shaw and Alicia Baxter are on crash duty. Then our prayer meeting preceding the 45, 5.45, the gospel service at 6.30. Now, I did mention this morning, and this is one I did have trouble with, I did ask the pastor this morning, uh, we did say that Hanny Fanky would be the singer next Sunday evening. I thought the pastor was playing a joke with me, but we've got our wires crossed, and it's actually the Hanna family. So there's a, bit, <laughs> there's a bit of translation there. So this is why I always write information in capitals. So if there's any joined up writing, you can't make some mistakes. So if anyone's passing any messages on, please write in capitals. So this... <laughs> doesn't happen again. There will be no youth fellowship next Sunday night either because they've been away on the Friday night. Pastor Taylor will be speaking at both services next Lord's Day. If you please remember to return any Baptist mission or Rackery mission boxes to the treasure as soon as possible. And just to remember that next Sunday, the 26th of November, it is the half yearly benevolent fund offering and all money should be put in the baskets provided in the hall not in our normal baskets. These are all announcements and they're all made subject to the will of God. We're going to ask the Walker sisters if they would come now and bring the first of their pieces. Thank you. times I will bless him, his praise will be in my mouth, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. The humble man shall hear of him, the afflicted will be glad, and join with me to magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together.
of my fears, let us exalt His name together forever. Oh, sing His praises, magnify the Lord. Let us exalt His name together forever. Let us exalt His name together forever. Oh, sing His praises, magnify the Lord. Oh, sing His praises, magnify the Lord. Oh, sing His praises, magnify. Thanks so much to the Walker sisters. They are coming back again, and we look forward to that. And just before they do that, let's stand and sing together 219 in the Red Book. 
219. Sorry, we don't have PowerPoint tonight, but sing your very best. 219, there's nothing like the old, old story. Grace is free. Grace is free. So without the introduction, let's stand and sing. sisters, please come again. It's lovely to have you tonight, and we appreciate you coming very much. Thank you.
Well, thanks again to the Walker sisters for joining us tonight. We do appreciate that very, very much indeed. Now, turn with me, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. We're going to commence our reading at verse 25. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 25 and through to verse 37. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Amen. God will add his blessing to this very familiar portion of his word tonight. In the opening verses in Luke chapter 10, you and I were 
thinking about our own lives individually and knowing that one day we must all face death at one time or another, and that one day we're going to step out into God's great eternity, I asked you this question, what are you going to do with the message of the gospel? Remember that the Lord Jesus Christ had sent out 70 disciples for the work of evangelism. He had sent them out to heal diseases. He had sent them out to bring hope to those who were living in the darkness of their sin. And yet as they went out, the Lord Jesus Christ pronounced judgment upon those who would hear his word and yet who would not respond to that same word. And you and I need to realize that sometimes in life we are given glorious opportunities to hear the gospel of God's grace. Some of us have been cradled in the gospel, maybe from very young children. We've been brought up in a Christian home. We've heard the gospel. We know it inside out, and we're still not saved. And if that is true of your life, then you've got to understand this, that not only will you have to account for that, but you will face the judgment of God by your refusal to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. When Jesus sent these 70 out, we saw the principles for evangelism in Luke chapter 10. They were divinely appointed. They were directed to go out. They were reminded of the task that they faced, and they warned of the difficulties that they would also have to face. And then we saw the pronouncement of Jesus, and he uh, speaks about three different cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And the Lord Jesus Christ, we know from the reading of God's Word, that he often went through the villages and through the towns and the cities as he shared the gospel with others. But he highlights these three cities, and he does so for a number of reasons. First of all, they had all enjoyed special privileges. These were cities in Galilee where the Savior had demonstrated his power and absolute authority. They were familiar with who he was and what he had come to do, but their attitude was careless, and they would not receive the Lord Jesus Christ. They had all expressed stubborn refusals. In Matthew's account, he says, he began to upbraid the cities where most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. They had all the facts. They had Jesus in the midst. Here was the Messiah that they had longed for for generations. And when Jesus came, stood in their midst and told them the truth, they rejected him. And they all heard a solemn pronouncement. Jesus said to those three cities, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. These people didn't realize in their refusal to accept the gospel and to turn to Christ that one day the judgment of God will fall swiftly upon each one of those cities and it would happen because of their stubbornness and their refusal to believe the gospel. Friend, tonight I say this very lovingly, but very honestly. If you do know the gospel inside out, and you have been cradled in the gospel, and you've never come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would urge you to repent of your sin and to put your trust in him. You dare not die without Christ and go out into a lost eternity. What about these verses tonight? We come to Luke 10, the parable of the good Samaritan. I'm sure that all of us, as we've read through, especially the gospel accounts, and as we walk with the Lord Jesus during his earthly ministry, you and I will know that very often in order to explain something, the Lord Jesus Christ would speak by way of a parable. In fact, we know this because the Bible records it. Some parables are longer than others, but the word parable is used 48 times in the first three Gospels. Why a parable? Well, very simply, a parable is a story that places one thing beside another for the purpose of teaching. 
And very often, the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking to crowds, would turn around and he would teach a parable. And in that parable, he wanted the people to see something concerning their own lives. He wanted them to understand either something regarding him and his mission or something about God and the love that he had for the souls of men. You see, a parable teaches something that is not only important about ourselves or something that is important about God. Let me come to this parable with you tonight very quickly, and I want you to see three very simple things here from a very familiar parable, and I have to say sometimes a parable that is greatly misunderstood. First of all, look at the context of this story. Look at the context of that story that I've just read to you tonight in Luke chapter 10. It's referred to as the parable of the Good Samaritan, and Jesus comes to speak to a man here who came with a very important question. Look at verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, we have to understand that when this man comes and he approaches the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not everything that you and I might think he is. For when he came to the Lord Jesus Christ, he wasn't interested in what he might hear by way of truth, because after all, this man was a lawyer. He knew the truth of God's Word. He already knew in his own heart the answer to the question that he had actually asked the Lord Jesus Christ on this occasion. This man was not a searching man for the truth. This man was a subtle man who was seeking to put the Lord Jesus Christ to the test. He wanted to embarrass Jesus in front of the crowd who were gathered that day. He was an expert in the law. Jesus didn't need to give this man an answer to his question. This man, after all, was an expert in these important matters. He was well-versed in the Pentateuch, which, of course, are the first five books of the Bible, sometimes referred to as the law, other times the law of Moses. And this man simply asked Jesus the question in order to catch Jesus out. But Jesus knew what was happening. You can't fool him. Doesn't the Bible tell us that the Lord Jesus Christ knows what's in the heart? of every man. You go into John's gospel and you think of a man who was brought along and Jesus met him on the way. His name was Nathaniel. And before that man ever spoke to Jesus or Jesus spoke to him, Jesus knew what Nathaniel was thinking. He knew where he was headed and he knew every detail about his life. It's the same with you and it's the same with me and it was exactly the same for this expert in the law, a proud man, a man who came to belittle Jesus, a man who already knew the answer to his own question, and this man knew, but he didn't apply the teaching of the law to his own heart. And he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This man was a man who was not just asking a question he already knew the answer to, but this man was trying to justify himself. We'll come to that. But Jesus exposed this man for all that he was. But you see the question that the man asked? Let me pause for a moment in passing. The lawyer asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's a great question. That's a question that every man or woman needs to ask themselves and ask the Lord Jesus so that they might get an answer. An answer to one of the most important questions that any individual could ever ask. There was another man who came and asked a similar question referred to as the rich young ruler. And he came likewise to the Lord Jesus and he said, Master, what must I do or what can I do or shall do in order that I might inherit eternal life. You know, it's a wonderful thing 
when in your journey through life you pause, and amidst all that is going around you, and in all that is going on within you, that you stop and you think about eternity. Eternity. This man asked the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Maybe with all that he knew, he didn't understand the implications of that question. But I love the way that William Hendricks in the commentator puts it. He says this. It refers to a life that is not only endless in its duration, but a life that is priceless in its quality. Eternal life is the life that we have when we come in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him as our Savior. Can I ask you tonight, do you have eternal life? Have you ever come and repented of your sin and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Has there ever been a moment in your life when you've stopped and honestly thought about life and death and eternity and asked yourself the question, where are you going to spend it? Now, eternal life is something that to your mind might mean something to do with eternity, and that is true in a sense. But on the other hand, eternal life is something that you and I can have in time. Because you see, this is real life that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Him alone. This is a spiritual life that will fill the deepest longing in your soul. This is eternal life. It's something that we can enjoy now, but we'll rejoice in in the future. It is life more abundant in Jesus, and it's something tonight that you could have. And eternity is something you could be absolutely sure about, but you'll have to come and put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You say to me, hold on a moment, Pastor. I have life as it is, and I enjoy the life that I have. I have a life tonight that I enjoy to the full. I have absolutely everything in my life that I need. There's nothing you can give me in any way that would make my life better. Is that true? Don't be deceived tonight in thinking that you're living when in fact you're only existing. Because people who live without Jesus Christ, they don't have the life that he has come to give in abundance. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it in all its abundance. I know the devil will tell many today, and we see the evidence of it all around us in the world in which we live. The devil will tell us that we're living, but in order to live more and to do better and get this and get that, he'll take us deeper into sin, further away from God. And the further we get away from God and the deeper we get into sin, we still have a soul that is hungry. We still have a soul that is thirsty. We still have a soul that finds no satisfaction whatsoever in the world in which we live. I don't know what your circumstances are tonight. I don't know where you stand in the light of eternity. I don't know what you think about spiritual things in general and eternal life in particular. But my friend, I want to tell you this. The way of the world is not the way to go. When the devil tries to convince you that power and pleasure and prosperity and all these other things are the answer to your sin-sick soul, I'm telling you one day you're going to find out that that was on true. You say, but pastor, listen. I am telling you, and I'm telling you straight up from my heart tonight, I have everything in life that I need, and I don't need Jesus. Well, let me ask you this, kindly, lovingly. 
Let me ask you this. That life that you're living to the full, when you have lived life to the full and time has run its course, what then? When your days of pleasure are gone and your soul still empty, what then? And when you come to the end of your life, you take that last breath. And you go out into God's great eternity. What then? I tell you this. I said it at the start and I'll say it again. Don't die without Christ. Don't die without hope. You want to be sitting here tonight or in the comfort of your own home with this great assurance, life, life, eternal life. Jesus alone is the giver. Life, life, abundant life. Glory to Jesus forever. If you haven't got Christ, you haven't got what will carry you safely through death and out into eternity. It doesn't matter what else you have or how much pleasure it brings to you. I'm telling you this, unless you come now in repentance and in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never possess this life. Never. And yet that's what you need. That's what you need for you before you're ushered into eternity. The context of this story, a teacher of the law says, Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Look at the content of the story for a moment. This man had asked a very important question, and we can see that as the conversation between Jesus and this expert and the law continues they begin to talk about loving one's neighbor. And then this man asked another important question, for he turns around and he says this, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And of course, Jesus, again, knew that this young man knew the answer to that question. But he simply wanted to justify himself in the sight of Christ. I think personally, by this stage, this man has dug a hole for himself and he's looking for a way out. And at this stage, Jesus tells him the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let me tell you two things about this story, this parable. The first is this, that this is a story of great neglect. Great neglect. This story is based around a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, if you're aware of the Mediterranean countryside in Jesus' day, you will know that this man would have to have traveled about 17 miles down a very steep decline. It wasn't only steep, it was dangerous. It was a rugged, mountainous area, and because of the nature of the territory, robbers would often come and they would attack, attack people, and they would then take all that they had and run. That's what happened to this man. He had been beaten by robbers. He had all that he had stolen. He was left in a terrible state. He was rendered helpless. He's lying by the side of the road. And look what happens. A priest comes down the same road, sees the man lying at the side of the road, and with all his great need, the priest passed him by. And then comes a Levite. He sees the man. He passes by on the other side. Now, the interesting thing about these two men is that these two men knew what God's Word taught them. These two men knew what they should have done, and that was show this man mercy, but they didn't do it. They avoided their duty. They neglected this man and his need. Those of us who are Christians tonight, let me say this in passing. There are many people tonight in our sin sick society, and they're in great need. 
Don't pass them by. Don't walk past them as if they didn't count. Because you see, you and I who are believers tonight should not neglect the people of our day and generation. They're wounded and sore with all the battles they've faced in life. They're helpless and hopeless because sin has ravaged them. They've been given up by society. Some of them have been given up by their families. Some of them have wasted their lives like the prodigal in riotous living. And these people are living on our doorsteps. They're living in our town. They're living all around us. And you and I must be careful that we're not passing them by with no thought for their soul. You and I have the responsibility to bring Jesus to them because he's the only answer to their problem. This is a story of great neglect. Do you care enough? Do I care enough that I would go out tonight and through this week tell people about Jesus? But secondly, this is a story of great compassion because we read here of another man, a man who was the enemy of this man, and he was willing to help. He was a Samaritan. The Jews hated the Samaritans and vice versa, but he comes to him with all his great need. Look at what he does. He takes pity on them. That's the first thing. He seeks to put bandages on his bruised body. He puts them on his donkey. He takes them to an inn. He gives the innkeeper money the equivalent of two days' wages, and he says this, if that's not enough, I'll pay you more when I return. That's love. That's compassion. And that's mercy. Do you know what that also is? It's a great picture of the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, remember this, that you and I were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. You and I were separated from God because of our sin. We were enemies, alienated. And I'll tell you this, the Son of God's love, Jesus Christ, did not pass us by. When there was no one to pity us, he pitied us when there was no one who would stretch out a hand to meet our need, he stretched out his arm and he lifted us up. And despite all that we had done and despite everything that we were, God looked upon us with mercy and with love and with compassion and he sent his son to be our savior. To put it as simply as I can, Jesus came from heaven to earth. He came to where we were. Lifted us out of the mire of our sin. Brought us salvation. Give us a hope and time and a home for eternity. And not one of us tonight ever deserved it. That's compassion. That's mercy. That's grace. And he loved us so much, he poured out his soul unto death, shed his blood for our souls, gave himself in our stead, paid a debt in full that we could never pay. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, I want you to know that watch what Jesus did for you. That's why he came from heaven. That's why in eternity past, God's great plan of salvation was drawn up. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Love that was revealed in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came from heaven's glory into this world to save sinners like you and sinners like me. I tell you this. He could have left us all lying at the side of the road like a man that was beaten and wounded. But he didn't do it. Instead, he came right to you, right to me, and he lifted us out of the mire of our sin, brought us to know him as our Savior. 
And I'm telling you, my friend, tonight, if you're not saved, he will do that for you. I had a hymn picked tonight, and then I changed it, and I'm glad I did, because the girls sang it. Jesus paid it all. All to him. I, O oh, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. You might say to me tonight, but Pastor, I'd love to believe that, but he's never going to come to where I am. Why? Well, because, Pastor, my life's a mess. My home's a wreck. And you could go on and you could give a list of things about your life. Things that are so terrible and some of them so tragic that you wouldn't want others to know. Well, I can tell you this, Jesus already knows. And not only does he know, but he wants to save you from that life. And he's the only one that can. You might be worried about the sin that marks your life, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ will come to where you are, and he'll lift you out of what you are, and he'll give you life that's worth living. He'll deal with your sin in its entirety if you bend your knee in repentance and come to him in simple fear. You say, how do you know that? Well, I know it from experience. But I also know it because the Bible declares it, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save good people. No. He said himself, I haven't come to call the, the righteous but sinners to repentance. Friend, listen, it doesn't matter how deep down in sin you might be. It doesn't matter the mess you might have made of your life. It doesn't matter if you've made a mess of three lifetimes in your young life. I'm telling you here and now, the one who came from the heights of heaven and went to the cross at Calvary came for you. Came to die for you came to save you. You'll find compassion and mercy and grace like that and none other but the Lord Jesus Christ. The context of this story, the content of this story, the climax of this story, Jesus brings this conversation to an end swiftly by asking this expert on the law who was the real neighbor. Do you know what he said? He said it was the man who took pity on the wounded man. Do you know the point that Jesus was making? It's not who is our neighbor, but what kind of a neighbor are you? Great question, isn't it? What kind of a neighbor am I? Like the two who walked past the man wounded and bleeding. Will you and I stand someday at a, a friend's funeral or a member of our own family circle and turn around and say, well, you know, all I can tell you is this, he wasn't saved and today he's lost in hell. What if he was to cry from the grave, why did you not tell me? Why did you not come to me? Why did you not knock my door? Why did you not bring Jesus to me and bring me to Jesus? What kind of a neighbor am I? The best judge of that are those that live around me. What kind of a neighbor are you? You see, as we face another week, we're going to meet people from every walk of life battered and bruised because of the fall, lives that are ruined and marred with sin, helplessly, hopelessly lost. Are we going to pass by on the other side? 
Are we going to be prepared to get alongside them, show them pity, great compassion, and reach out to them with the love of Jesus? Because that's the kind of neighbor Jesus wants us all to be. Let's bow for a moment quietly in prayer. Father, tonight we thank you. We thank you so much that you ever sent your Son to be our Savior. And we're so thankful tonight, so many of us, that we have eternal life through faith in him. But Father, there are multitudes all around us living without Christ, dying without hope. Help us to be the people we ought to be and help us to show them mercy, compassion, and great love. For those tonight who are not saved, help them to realize that they're not a lost cause, though they might think they are. For Jesus came to seek them, to save them, so that one day they might share heaven with him. And so we pray that you would give them grace to see themselves as they really are and to repent of their sin and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Father, this is a simple parable, but says so much to each one of us. May the Spirit of God write upon our hearts what we need to know. And may the Spirit of God save those who know that they need to be saved, that they might have eternal life. We ask it for our good and for your glory. And in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to our closing hymn tonight. I was going to say it's up on the screen, but it's not because the screen's not working. So it's 273 in the red book. 273, only a step to Jesus. Then why not take it now? Come thy sin confessing to him, thy Savior. Bow. Let's sing the first two verses and the chorus as we close. Father, we thank you that you're a God of great mercy. We thank you that it's not your will that any should perish. We pray, therefore, that those who know not the Savior, who don't have this eternal life, we pray that they might come in repentance and faith to the one who has come, that we all might have life and have it more abundantly. 
But Father, help us not to be the kind of people who walk by others that we know that are unsaved, whose lives are steeped in sin. How will they know and know if they're ever, if they're not told? How will they ever be saved if nobody tells them of Jesus? We pray that we will be a people concerned about those around us, that we might love them as Christ loved them, and that we might reach them as he would want us to do. Thank you for the ministry tonight of the Walker sisters. We commend them to you as they minister in other places, and we just ask, Lord, your blessing upon them, upon us, and all who have joined us tonight on Facebook. May your blessing rest upon us. May your grace prove to be sufficient for us, and may we know something of your presence throughout this week. And we give you thanks for another Lord's Day in the Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen.